and greetings. Welcome. Happy 4th of July on the 5th of July. Look, I even drew a flag, but not only did I draw one, I'm, I resemble one. <laughs> um, I uh, want to welcome everyone and anyone uh, new and old, meaning uh, a uh, veteran of these exegetical broadcasts or new. There's Leonard. And look, I can salute myself with the flag. Oh, you know what? Uh, well, no, I'm not going to bother putting on my ball cap. Um, but anyway, so here we are once again. Uh, we make a point of being together on Mondays and Wednesdays. And a lot of Mondays are holidays. And uh, thank you, Leonard. Yeah, I mentioned a happy fourth at the beginning. And, and here, what I didn't mention yet, we are exegesis number 160 tonight. And it's very interesting because we're celebrating freedom and the author of our freedom, who is God. And I can see the Lord Jesus Christ, who's a part of the Godhead. But also, we're going to be doing the doctrine of the heart out of our text, this wonderful mental attitude dynamics text. And... Um, we will be in principles and practice of Greek exegesis. Now, um, it's been, I've been working right up to the last moment here as far as putting things together. Um, and it's been a really good day and a couple of days because I started doing this a couple of days ago. And um, what I'm going to try and do now, I'm putting together some sets of pictures. Uh, let me see which ones do I want. I want this one. I'm putting them on the desktop. And let's see, I want these three. Oops. And this last one. So there's a ton of them. And I put them all out there so that we're ready to check this stuff out. And there's a whole bunch of stuff we're going to see tonight. And so I guess part of the preliminaries, and I'll try and do this fast to make up for lost time. Um, there is a ministry, Grace Doctrine Church in St. Charles. Uh, it's in St. Charles, Missouri, next door pretty much to St. Louis. And there is a pastor there, Joe Griffin, who has been there for, I think this is his 36th year, and his birthday is coming up here at the end of the month. And um, they charge nothing for the materials that they offer. And this particular book, I wanted to mention for today, uh, the information of what's it right here, where it says, the Constitution of Grace Doctrine Church. But look, the American State Papers, the Declaration of Independence, and the United States Constitution. And there's a description of this logo here that's very cool, too. Now, we don't have time to get into all of that, but uh, I guess, let's see, how do I do this? <laughs> I got my shirt on, and the book is, you know, uh, kind of matching. Uh, we are going to look at the First and Second Amendments, and appreciate them. Did I leave my glasses over there? All right. Let me throw on a graphic just for fun. <laughs> I can do that, and while you're looking at it, I can go and get the uh, glasses. Did I really leave them over there? I think I did. All right. Let's get out this picture. Uh-oh, it's not set up yet. All right, well, I'll make it happen. There we go. And now I can select it. All right. Wanted you to see this. All right. Um, this is Colonel R.B. Theme Jr. And three different pictures of him that I think it's kind of interesting because it has to do with our book. 
And let me see if I can blow this up a little bit for you and uh, make me a little smaller. Our book, Mental Attitude Dynamics, that we've been finishing here, we're almost done. Next week, we will finish it, um, had three different pictures. And that's what I did. I, I wanted you to see the three pictures. We can do this this way. I think I can get it to where you can kind of, oh, oh, that's right, the third one. The picture is on the, the back. So if I do this, I can hold up the three books. But since you already have these three pictures, uh, and they're in this order, I guess. Let me see if I can do that right. <laughs> it's a little bit difficult. There, I'm getting it. Now, of course, you can see it bigger. Uh, and I'll just make it real big there. Oh, that's no bigger. It's just uh, center. All right. Well, anyway, what's funny is we're looking at this on the top picture, mental attitude dynamics, which became the second picture where uh, you see him here in his uh, Lieutenant Colonel Army Air Corps. Actually, at that point, probably Air Force. Um, uh, I always call it regalia. But so mental attitude dynamics. And let me switch this. Uh-oh. Yeah, I wanted it more like that. Became mental attitude dynamics. Became, it's hard doing this backwards on the, uh, <laughs> looking at the monitor. Um, eventually became this version of mental attitude dynamics. And, but what I like is in these three pictures, you see the Colonel in his uh, younger days a little bit as pastor. And then, I don't know, this may be, um, believe it or not, around the same era or later. And then, you know, there's the regular picture that we now see on all the publications that we get. Um, whenever you get one, it has that. Now, what the reason I'm bringing all this up right now is because we're going to start a new book in two weeks, not next Monday, but the Monday after. Oh, and I guess I can take this picture down now. Let's see. Boom. Um, I have an older version here, and this is, believe it or not, our next text. Now, this one on Thursday, I will have had for uh, 41 years. If you can believe that. Um, if you can, believe me, it's harder for me to believe it than you. <laughs> um, now, what happened is they've got, this is the newer edition. And... Here's what it says about it, and you'll want to get this and start watching what we're up to. The third edition was published in 2001, the second impression, 2004. If you can see it toward the middle of the screen there, screen. Uh, third edition published 2001, second impression, 2004. And so financial policy, they never charge anybody anything. There is no charge for any material from RB Theme Junior Bible Ministries. So these books are paid for. You just ask for them. How about that? Now, um, this particular copy that I have, it shows that the original release of it was in um, 1979, and first edition published in was in 73. I'm sorry. So say that right. The first edition was in 73. Oh, you've got the same new issue, Leonard? Oh, by the way, I haven't put up any of uh, Leonard's uh, greetings. And so I think the good evening is to me, but it's to you too, uh, just from Leonard, right? And uh, let's see, can I get that to work? And there you go. Uh, happy fourth um, and fifth. And so the same issue, um, I'm assuming correctly, must be because I don't think this one's been available for decades. But yeah, there's the new one. So 
Uh, Leonard is good to go. And anybody else who wants it can also be good to go because all you have to do is ask for it and you'll get a lot of other cool stuff. Um, you should ask as well for the doctrinal Bible studies catalog. And here's the information. So uh, I got a yep that uh, we got the same issue um, of the heathenism book. Here's the information. I'll blow it up nice and big and leave it up there for a minute. So you've got the P.O. box. You've got a phone number. You've got the website. And like it says right above there, uh, materials are available. Can't see everything that I'm covering. Let me see if I can get that. Cannot be overemphasized. And... Somewhere it says there is no charge. Where the heck is that part? Uh, oh, at the very bottom. Yep. All of the classes, MP3, CD, video recordings, DVDs are available, no charge, without obligation. So, all right, that's some of the preliminaries. Let's go quickly to the other part. Most people that watch these scopes, which is only a handful at this point, and I haven't done anything about it, I, I should be making it possible for more people to know about it. And that requires me doing a little bit of legwork, and I haven't done it yet. So we'll get there, uh, and hopefully more people will know. But the first thing is, for anybody who's new, if you're kind of new, expect that some of this is going to be off the wall. You may not understand uh, certain things, but don't worry about it. It's kind of like kids, you know, when you're growing up, there's a lot of stuff you don't understand and it makes more sense later. And uh, what we do here are exegetical studies. And tonight you're going to see some interesting background on all this stuff uh, through the doctrine of the heart, <laughs> excuse me, and what else? Uh, in the exegesis manual um, that I don't know it's available anymore. But this is. My uh, wonderful graphic uh, looks like the Ten Commandments or something, a nice scroll, and I uh, modeled it a little bit after that. But you can read it up and down or left and right. And so I go left to right. Grace and the gospel are good news. Religion is not good news. True or pure Christianity is not a religion. And if you think Christianity is a religion, I always say, hear me out. Uh, why is it not a religion? Because religion is man-made, and God uh, is not man, except for the God-man. But he was God first, and then he became man. It's a hypostatic union, and there are a lot of fancy words uh, because theology, and you'll see some of it tonight, was some very interesting stuff. I hope we can spend enough time on it. So I'm doing a quick, let's call it minimal type covering of the doctrine of the heart and you'll see what that's about after we have this moment of silent prayer to prepare ourselves to study biblical theological exegetical uh spiritual and supernatural stuff stuff that you can't figure out the details just on your own using your mind you need a uh hyper or hoop, hoop, hoopo. Uh, in this case, it means above. I mean, not hoopo, hooper, hooper. Um, it's hyper, get it? It's above. Um, you need more than a brain. You need a brain that can orient to theological, supernatural, spiritual, exegetical, biblical stuff. And uh, this diagram says that... Uh, it, in all kinds of weird abbreviations and stuff, that if you do not have a relationship with the God of the universe, it's, this is showing that you wouldn't understand things that are supernatural and spiritual. Why? Because they're higher. Remember? Hooper, which translates from the Greek into English, hyper. And hyper means, you know, up above, that type of thing. And it is above. It's above us. Spiritual stuff is higher and above us. And in Isaiah uh, 
we learn that God's ways are higher than our ways. And he doesn't say, so it's my way or the highway. He says, it's my way. He doesn't even say or the highway. You can take the highway, but that's your problem. He just says, it's my way. <laughs> Remember the song? He created it his way. All right, enough of the nonsense. We're going to have a moment of silent prayer. If you do not have a relationship with the God of the universe or you don't know that you do, it's as simple as believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, Acts 16, 31. It's as simple as faith alone in Christ alone. By saying, God, I don't even understand if that's real or true or right or what, but I'll go ahead and try it. I can accept it. I can go to the foot of the cross and say, um, God, if that's what you want me to do is believe in the Lord or believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, bingo. What happens when you do that in truth, capital T, is you get placed into union with Christ or Messiah, and that's forever and ever and ever. That's your salvation. You're connected to God through Christ. So at that moment, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit indwell your body. They do not before that. It's a fact part of the uh, fall of man. And so if you understand that, then what happens is at that moment you say, okay, so somehow God is in me. That's what Emmanuel is with us God in Hebrew, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us, Christmas, all that. This, uh, this isn't just a bunch of baloney that came out of nowhere. This actually came from somewhere. It came from God. God brought it down to man through inspired men who uh, wrote the scriptures and continued to, uh, what's the word, perpetuate them by copying them. And that we're going to see a lot about that tonight. I got to keep going. All right, so we're going to take a moment for silent prayer because those of you who understand, we got to be filled with the Spirit. If we're not through sin and instead we're controlled by the old sin nature because we have Adam's original sin. That's for everybody. It's not a believer. For everybody who's a believer, you still have it. You still have an old sin nature, but they get canceled out in general because you're filled with the spirit. But if you sin, oops, then you're back. You're out of that bottom circle and you need to rebound. First John 1, 9, we read that book. Um, it's one of the free books. And um, you're back in the bottom circle filled with the Holy Spirit and ready to study the amazing things that are God's high ways, higher than our ways. And then that means that you can uh, learn these spiritual supernatural things. So let's take a moment and have silent prayer. And then we will begin in earnest, starting with the doctrine of the heart in our text. And then we'll go on to principles and practice of exegesis and all that. Oops, I have one more thing though that I wanna do uh, from the state papers in 40 proclamations uh, from the Grace Doctrine Church Library. And uh, we will absolutely look at that before uh, we you know, get started in our text. See if that stays up. No, it won't. Oh, it's because of the wind that's blowing ah, from the fan. And the fact that this is not angled back enough. But if I angle it more, you won't be able to read the top there. All right. So anyway, let us pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for this moment, a time for rebound if necessary, that we would be able to study um, the spiritual things that you have for us that come directly out of the Bible and that are a part of theology and understanding how to think theologically and, and be filled with the spirit. So therefore spiritually, uh, we always thank you. Uh, it's through our Lord Jesus Christ that we have the possibility of having a relationship with you. And we appreciate the fact that um, by faith alone in Christ alone, we have a new spiritual life. We go from being dichotomous to being trichotomous. We go from having a body and a soul to having a body, a soul, and a human spirit. And it's so amazing that all these things are in the scriptures and are ready for us to learn 
but all we need is to spend the time with the properly prepared, uh, trained exegetes, pastors and teachers and missionaries and anybody in ministry that is doing stuff, uh, the Bible school teachers, um, the teachers that teach the kids in the um, Sunday school classes, anybody that is a believer and has enough doctrine in their soul is able to learn and then the responsibility to repeat and explain these doctrines. Tonight, we're going to see how that all comes together, how that works as we look from both the study of the doctrine of the heart, as well as our manual for uh, learning about principles and practice of exegesis. So we thank you for all these things. And as always, we ask them, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in Christ's name, amen. And voila, here we are, 5th of July, a holiday on a Monday. And uh, I hope you had a terrific 4th of July weekend. If you didn't, I hope that the week goes better. And that because of what you're going to see and hear tonight, that your life will continue to get better and better. Uh, that's what mine is doing. And let's take a look as I wear the flag and as we read from the flag book, not a flagship. <laughs> um, I thought it would be interesting to see that in, in this particular text, we have, it's really great. We have the, um, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and it's just, you know, several pages here of, of notes, starting with, of course, um, in Congress, July 4th, 1776, a declaration by the representatives of the United States of America in General Congress assembled. And it starts with the famous words, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God, mm -hmm, entitle them a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Okay. And that's how our de declaration of independence begins. Now we get to the constitution and it starts with a preamble. We, the people. Okay. How many times have we heard that lately? And I'm going to mention just that in Article 1, Section 1, it says, All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. Well, you may not know the rest. I hope you do. Section 2 talks about everything that goes on in the House of Representatives. Section three goes into the Senate and it goes on and on and on. Section eight, um, and it goes on. And then finally, you get into the, let me see if I can find the beginning. Got all these articles and sections. We get to the amendments. And the amendments, it says, the following text is a transcript of the 27 amendments to the Constitution. First, uh, the first 10 were ratified December 15, 1791, and form what is known as the Bill of Rights. There it is, Bill of Rights. And let's take a look at, I figured, Amendment 1 and Amendment 2, and that's it, okay? Okay, Amendment 1. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion ha, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, that's us, ta-da, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. 
Do we ever have a lot of issues with all that right now? More so than ever before in our 245 year history, uh, at least if you consider July 4th, 1776 as day one because there's a lot that happened between 76 and 89 and 91. Okay, 1789, 1791-ish. Amendment two, a well-regulated militia. Okay, check this out. This is a, an amendment added to the Constitution. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, not country, state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's all it says. There's no other language and there's not much interpretation necessary to understand what Amendment 2 says. So um, I stopped there with the First and Second Amendments and uh, heartily encourage you. And in fact, uh, it would behoove you, I could exhort you, to, if you haven't done so lately, read all of these notes so that you can have a review and a better understanding of all the stuff that's going on, okay? A lot of stuff going on. All right, last thing again I will mention, in two Mondays, not next Monday, but the one after that, if all goes as planned, we will start this book, which in the back, it shows basics books, recommended sequence. And if you go down toward the bottom, there's 14 of them. So you go back 13, 12, 11, 10. 10 is heathenism. We have read all of the other books th finishing in next week, Mental Attitude Dynamics. We also did uh, number 12 there, prayer. So. We're, we've almost done all these books, and I'm sorry if you weren't there to do them together, but good news, you can get them and one by one go through them. If you have any questions, please contact me. I've got either my email or the snail mail P.O. box in Prescott, Arizona. Uh, I live up in the mountains just off of to the side, a couple of minutes away from downtown Prescott, I'm in Williamson Valley, and uh, it's quite nice here. And uh, I am very happy to be here, to have made it to this place, <laughs> and voila. So, as I said, uh, I wanted us to, you know, get to see a couple of things, and starting with the First and Second Amendments on this 5th of July Fourth of July weekend and holiday. And now I want to continue where we left off in this book. We are in the very back in the appendices. And I have made copies of this because I knew it would be small and that many of you might not have it. So right now I'm going to, let me see what I have open. Let me close anything that I want closed. And let me see if I can open up the right pages here. Ah, I did. All right, the first one that we wanna look at is our page. Let me get this open for you. Boom. The Doctrine of the Heart, make it a little bit bigger. Now, I'm going to make it bigger than that even. Um, I took a, let me make sure I have the right one here. The side shot, yep. Um, but I want you to see that Appendix B, it doesn't have a page number, but it's page 53 in our text. And um, I wanted you to see that uh, we're going to tonight read through it but instead of actually reading uh, every Bible scripture reference, I'm going to maybe pick one or the other. I probably shouldn't to save time uh, as usual. Got to save time here because there's just so much to do in uh, quite 
a short amount. Let me, I mean, you know, we'll read through stuff and then we'll see what we can accomplish. All right. This one will be nice and big. In fact, I can still stay on the side here and you can pretty much read it. Uh, I'd like to get a confirmation from Leonard if it's as clear, because I know that if you're watching it on a TV on YouTube, for example, it'd be different on a TV screen, nice big screen, than on an iPhone or another, you know, some, uh, what do you call it, uh, other kind, other brand of phone. Um, can't think of the right word that I want to say for the other non-iPhones, um, but all of them. Perfect. All right. So what I did, I underlined one word there under A is divine. Um, let's, let's read that paragraph. Okay. Here's the definition of the doctrine of the heart in Appendix B. Yeah. On an iPhone, it's small, but I, I'm wondering, are you able to blow it up? Or is it just big enough to read even on an iPhone? I've asked the, that question to hopefully be able to get a, a simple answer and ma make it easy to answer. All right, let's read it, starting with definition of the doctrine of the heart, which is Appendix B. And it says, A, the word heart in the Bible from the Hebrew, and it, it says L-E-B, which we pronounce lave, Big enough as is. Excellent. Uh, and from the Greek word where we get cardiology and cardiologists and cardiothoracic surgery, of which I had a few. <laughs> Do you believe I had two of them? Can't blow it up on YouTube. Yeah, that's true on, on YouTube. And I wonder, that's probably true on the phone as well as uh, on a TV. But anyway, um, so you can't blow it up on either, I guess, on your iPhone or on the TV. Huh. I just figured that out because you're probably watching it on YouTube on your iPhone. All right. Continuing. So the Hebrew and Greek words, lave and cardia. And you know the Greek one from cardiology and all that stuff dealing with the heart. Rarely refers to the physiological heart, but... It is used for that part of the mentality of the soul called the, we call it the right lobe of the soul. Uh, the, and that's the locale for thinking, and I underline the word divine viewpoint. 1 Samuel 16, 7 and Proverbs 23, 7. Now, I want to look at both of those scriptures only because um, I thought it would be good. I'm going to use my... NET Bible. So if you'll go to um, to 1 Samuel 16, 7, um, and I'll tell you in case you have a um, an NET Bible, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7 is on page 510. And this is what it says. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't be impressed by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. God does not view things the way people do. So notice the locale for thinking divine viewpoint. We don't want to be thinking the way people do. We don't want to think human viewpoint. We want to be thinking divine viewpoint. So that's 1 Samuel 16, 7 on page 510. If anybody has a NET version that is paginated that way, because there may be different versions by now with different page numberings of all that of verses. But the other one we want to look at is Proverbs uh, 23, 7. And Proverbs is right after Psalms. And so 23, 7 is... On page uh, 1140, well, it starts at uh, 42, 1142. So I'll give you a second to get to page 1142 or whatever page your Bible has, Proverbs 23, 7. And you'll see why we're not going to be able to look at all the scriptures tonight. But I wanted you to see when it says what this paragraph says. 
So for example, that uh, the word cardia or lave is used for that part of the mentality of the soul called the right lobe, the locale for thinking, no, not for thinking the way we normally think, which I was telling you earlier, uh, if you don't have divine viewpoint, if you're not filled with the spirit, you're not gonna understand some of the concepts that we're gonna touch on tonight. So you have to have divine viewpoint and that's in the right lobe of the soul. And here's how it expresses it, um, how it expresses what we could call the difference between normal thinking, human brain thought, you know, system, and having this special filling of the spirit ability to think divine viewpoint. So on pages 1142 and 43 of the NET, Proverbs 23, 7, for he is like someone who has calculated the cost in his mind. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. So in Proverbs 23, 7, there's something there that we have to think of. It's like someone who has calculated the cost in his mind. Notice he's used his mind, he's used his thinking, but his heart is not with you. So what's the difference with the heart and the mind well the right lobe is the launching pad of the mind and it's the soul that has given to the mind the correct or biblical divine godly viewpoint and here you're seeing that there's someone um let's start at verse six do not eat the food of a stingy person you know, you've been invited and there's this stingy person and he likes to whoop it up and eat well. And so it says, do not crave his delicacies for he is like someone who has calculated the cost in his mind. Notice that would be in the left lobe, in the noose, not in the cardia. And <laughs> again, if these terms are not totally fluid in your thinking, or you're new and you hear me talking about the noose and the cardia, which is the left and right lobes of the mind, where the thinking and the, let's call it spiritual thinking, uh, reside in your brain when you're filled with the spirit so that you're connected to your soul and to the Bible doctrine in your soul, then this starts to make sense. It's, he is like someone who has calculated the cost in his mind. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. In other words, <clears throat> he has got some kind of an ax to grind or some kind of an agenda or something like that. And therefore, you're not seeing his earnest invitation and his fellowship with you of brotherly love Philos Adelphos, that's how you get Philadelphia. See, Greek comes in handy. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, because philos is a brotherly love. It's a kind of love. It's a friendship love. Um, and then Adelphos means brother. So Philos Adelphos, Philadelphia, brotherly love. Uh, that kind of love, not a love for a spouse, not even a love that would be for a parent or a child, not a love for your car or your dog or um, many things, your profession, your hobbies. It's philos is dealing with, with a friendship love, a brotherly love, something that's connected humanly speaking. And so this person in Proverbs 23, seven and six even, um, it even says it uh, in, let's start at 23. By the way, this is why we're not gonna go to all these verses. Look at C, see all those verses? We would be here for the next five weeks just on this section wouldn't get anywhere. But take a look at Proverbs 23, 
1 and following. Look what it says. Now you'll get the context of verse 7. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you possess a large appetite. Do not crave that ruler's delicacies, for that food is deceptive. Do not wear yourself out to become rich. Be wise enough to restrain yourself. When you gaze upon riches, they are gone for they surely make wings for themselves and fly off into the sky like an eagle. Do not eat the food of a stingy person. Do not crave his delicacies, for he is like someone who has calculated the cost in his mind. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. Continue on verse eight, <coughs> please. You will vomit up the little bit you have eaten and will have wasted your pleasant words. Verse nine do, uh, 9, do not speak in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of your words. And I'll stop there. But that gives you a feel. And if you have an NET Bible, look how small, let me change this for a second, how small the Bible part is. It's those center sections with the verse numbers. Look at all the notes around it. That's just notes for those verses. So if you do not have the NET Bible full notes edition, um, I can heartily uh, recommend it. And I know that uh, right now with us is Leonard, who has a copy of it. And it is a very rich version of the Bible. Now, we're going to speed up the process. I went slow to show you that if you wanted to study the doctrine of the heart and start looking at all of these uh, verses everywhere, and there are more and more of them, like in section C there, you see a bunch of them. It would take a long time to get through these five pages that we are going to get through, believe it or not, in the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes or so. See, there's lots and lots of scriptures here for you to look up. And let, when it says Proverbs 23, 7, we read 6, 7, 8, and we went back to 1, went all the way through 9. Um, yeah, through 9. A um, lot of work put into these books. And uh, yes, Leonard has put a wonderful comment that number one, it's a great translation of the Bible. It's very well translated, very easy to read like we just did to get a, a very good understanding, the gist of what is being said and what was written and what's going on. Secondly, it's got this incredible uh, treasure trove, a crypt, cryptos. I was a flying crypto linguist. I always do this. Let's see. Can I do this right? Where, where can I get it where you can see? Yeah. <laughs> Both hands. <laughs> I was a flying crypto linguist in the Naval Security Group and working for the National Security Agency. and. We would, the reason we're called cryptos is we would go into the hidden secret stuff. Well, it's a treasure trove of hidden secret stuff. And guess what? This version is like that. Now, I've digressed enough and delayed enough. Let's now get on with it. Let's try to get through the doctrine of the heart. So, we got it about the thinking of divine viewpoint, 1 Samuel 16, 7, Proverbs 23, 7. B, oh, let me go back to our, uh, I can do it this way. Start here at B. Uh, in fact, I better do it a little bit smaller so I can see in case there's any uh, comments. Ah, 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 here we go. Walk like an Egyptian. Yeah, that's. <laughs> uh, that's what's funny is they're they're facing this way right with the profile but their head is always facing you 
if you've ever noticed that. Uh, that's part of hieroglyphics. They do some really weird things. All right, I digress some more. Let's continue. Letter B, the usage of the word heart for the right lobe of the soul is based on the analogy to the physical heart, just as the heart is the pump that circulates blood through the body and thereby, there, blah, almost said therefore, thereby supports physical life. So the right lobe of the soul circulates Bible doctrine that supports the spiritual life of the believer. That's why we call it the launching pad. And it really is that. It is the launching pad of the Bible doctrine in your soul is in the cardia, the heart, which is like it says uh, what you think in the heart. Okay, if you have Bible doctrine in there, it is the launching pad and you can apply it and use it in your life. So letter C, the heart or right lobe is the target of gap. That's grace apparatus for perception. Uh, there used to be a book on that topic. Um, now that topic is taught through the various books, uh, Bob themes, books that are available for you and available to you at no charge. Okay, so gap is the source of concentration and application of doctrine to experience. Okay, that's grace apparatus for perception. Where does it say stuff like that and stuff about that in the scriptures? Look below. First Kings 3 9. And also in verse 12, also Job 38, 36. How about Psalm 19, 14 and Psalm 119, 11. Proverbs 2, 2 and also verse 10. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3, 4, verse 4, 10, verse 8, 15, 14 and 18, 15. Now, we don't have time to look at all those, but you do. And if you don't have the book, get the book. No charge, mental attitude dynamics. In the back, Appendix B, Doctrine of the Heart. You can get it. You have all these scriptures, and you could take a screenshot right now. You can still look them up if you don't have the book. That's why I made the, the graphic so that you could see all that. So watch this. Now I'm going to change. I'm going to stop that. Get rid of that one and get rid of the Appendix B graphic that I had earlier. And let me see if I can get to um, the next page. And let me pull this one up for you. And now we can continue. It's a little bit smaller writing, unfortunately. Um, so I'll be curious if you can see that on the iPhone, but it's centered there. And I could, if I went this big, it's no bigger, see? So I'm going to stay over here on the left side of your screen so that you can see me as we continue. This is a uh, major point to the essence of the heart. And uh, excuse me while I take a swig of my usual uh, Perrier or Pellegrino, forget which it is. I think it's Pellegrino today with lime. So cheers. Ah, thirsty. Good to drink. Summertime. More you drink, the better. All right, so anyway, the essence of the heart, which is on page 54, as you can see. Um, a, look at all these points. We got up to G. So we got eight different sections. Oh, I got a comment here that, I want to put up very clear, but looks small on iPhone. Yeah, I tried to make the pictures clear, you know, so you can really uh, see them. And so um, we're going to see there's a footnote 41 that says see Appendix C. Uh, that'll come up when it does. But let's go ahead and uh, read the essence of the heart. A, the frame of reference is the first compartment where doctrine enters the right lobe and becomes epinosis doctrine. That means instead of just knowledge, it becomes full knowledge, center knowledge, the, the all the way in, you know, the full knowledge, epinosis, like epicenter of an earthquake. Uh, here, doctrine accumulates gradually in increments and is used by the Holy Spirit to increase the believer's capacity to learn more doctrine. Truth builds upon truth. 
I would have made that second truth a capital T also just for fun. One doctrine upon another. That's what I was telling you. That's in Isaiah. I think it's uh, Isaiah 28, 14. It talks about um, uh, uh, here a little, there a little, you know, doctrine upon doctrine. And um, anyway, it's, it says here, truth builds upon truth, one doctrine upon another. The frame of reference not only retains doctrine, but cycles it to the other compartments of the right lobe. B, the memory center is where epinosis doctrine is stored and recalled. Psalm 119, verse 16, and Psalm 119, verse 93. Yes, it's a very long psalm. 119 is a famous long psalm. Long psalm. Almost sounds like lom song. You know, like you could uh, tongue twist with it. Long song. All right. So continuing in B, recall has nothing to do with a good human memory, but with the inculcation or repetition of doctrine. See, that's what inculcare means, to learn by repetition. So inculcare, the Latin word from which we get inculcation, you can look it up in your dictionary, teaching by repetition, learning it by repetition. So with the inculcation or repetition of doctrine and the mentorship of the Holy Spirit, John 14, 20. The memory center supplies pertinent doctrines for all other compartments. Lamentations 3, 20 and 21, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6, and 2 Peter 3, 2. See, if we looked up all those doctrine, I mean, those uh, scriptures, we'd be here a while. C, the vocabulary storage is the dictionary of the soul. The compartment, or this compartment, accumulates technical theological words and concepts to define God, man, salvation, the Christian way of life, and every other category of doctrine. Thinking demands vocabulary. Once these theological terms are mastered, they work together with the frame of reference and memory center to develop the believer's ability to think divine viewpoint. Deuteronomy 8.3. Jeremiah 15, 16, and Matthew 4, 4. I'll tell you Matthew 4, 4, just so that you get the idea. Man does not live by um, bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. See, a man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. See, and that's, again, from the mouth of God into the scriptures and the scriptures into our minds and souls, back into the minds. And with all of this stuff that I just mentioned here with these classifying subject matter and building, you know, you're going to see how you, <coughs> you learn these theological terms. You, they work together with your frame of reference and memory center and develop your ability to think divine viewpoint and apply it. It's a, a, totally amazing. D as in Delta. Categorical storage organizes principles of doctrine from the frame of reference and vocabulary storage. Scripture is compared with scripture so that doctrine is classified according to subject matter. That's what we call categories in ICE teaching. Isagogics, categories, and exegesis, I-C-E. Categories, what it just said here, where scripture is compared as categories, Compared with scripture, and that makes a category, and then you compare with some other scriptures, that stuff, that's another category. So that doctrine is classified according to subject matter. Knowledge is built upon or on knowledge. Categorical storage becomes the basis for understanding more advanced doctrines. Proverbs 2.2 2, and also verse 10, Proverbs 3.3, 3, which we saw earlier, where it said Proverbs 3.3 3 and Proverbs 4.4. 4. Let's see, was that on the previous page? Yep, yeah, on uh, letter C in uh, definition. <laughs> so it's the same verse. Sometimes you'll see the same verse again, <coughs> which, which is fine. Repetition and inculcation. Proverbs 2, 2, 10, also meaning verse 10, 2, 10. Proverbs 3, 3, Proverbs 15, verses 14 and 15, Proverbs 18, 5. By the way, when I elaborate and digress and go off on tangents and all that, you know, you could read this book 
by yourself and not watch these broadcasts, right? I'm hoping that by you watching and us going over this stuff, I add to it and hopefully um, amplify it in such a way that it'll make more and more sense to you. That's what I'm trying to do here. <clears throat> trying to, to make it make sense and to give it possibilities for you to be able to apply this stuff. Okay, E, the conscience is where norms and standards reside. It is the faculty of the soul that separates right from wrong, establishes priorities, and guides and regulates life. A strong conscience has standards built upon divine viewpoint, while a weak conscience is acquired from human viewpoint. Well, look at all these verses. Okay, it's at the bottom of the page there. Uh, try and see that. I'm going to say them all right now. Daniel 1 8, Acts 24 16, Romans 2 verses 14 and 15, Romans 13 5, 1 Corinthians 8 7, 2 Corinthians 4 2 and 5 11, 1 Timothy 4 1 and 2, uh, 2 Timothy 1 3, Titus 1 15, Hebrews 9 14, 1 Peter 2 18 and 19, and uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 14 through 16. And then there's the footnote 41. And at the very bottom, you can't maybe see it because I, I wrote it so, I mean, I, I copied it. It's so at the very bottom of the page, unfortunately. It just says point 41, C appendix C. Now we'll be looking at that next week. I got to go through all these pages here. Hold on, we got three more pages yet to go. Um, and then we will go next week to doctrine of the conscience. And that's, you know, that's where we're going next week. <clears throat> All right. Continuing, um, on, let's see, am I on the right, right deal here? Page 55, letter F. Ah. You know what I'm going to do? Switch. Let's kill this one. And let's go to, what is it, page 55. Let me see if I've got that right. That's 54. Then 55 must be this one. Oops. No, it's not that one either. It's not that one. Where is 55? There's 56. Uh-oh, hold on a sec. I got to find this page. Hang on a sec. Let me look here. I'm getting rid of every one that I don't want. All right, getting rid of this one. Got to get rid of them one at a time here. But I'm, I'm looking at all the different ones. Okay, 57, we'll get to that one in a minute. Appendix B, we don't need that one anymore. It's page 55. Had the small version of it. All right. I got a little dilemma here because I'm not sure. Let's see. What is the number? 4680. So I need 4659. Got it. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Getting a little better at all the shenanigans here. Five, nine should be this one. Uh oh. Huh. Wait a second. Five, nine, six. Oh, it's five, eight. I got to find 58. Hang on. Let's see if I can pull these guys up. There it is. Ha! Finally got it. All right. Uh, stop that screen and share a new one. Gosh, now I hope I can find it uh, in mini. Oh, yeah, because it's got the number. I needed five eight and 
There she blows. Sorry about the delay. All right, let's continue. Uh, and yeah, that's as big as I can make it. Okay, letter F. Momentum combines epinosis doctrine. So remember, that's full knowledge. That's biblical full knowledge kind of doctrine. Um, with the power of the filling of the Holy Spirit. So momentum combines that epinosis doctrine with the power of the filling of the Holy Spirit to motivate and accelerate spiritual growth. Second Peter 3.18. By the way, you know how far behind we'd be compared to me trying to find these notes uh, if we were reading the scriptures? Man, we would be way behind. All right, G. Wisdom is the result of epinosis knowledge and motivation from all other compartments of the right lobe. In this final compartment, the thinking of epinosis doctrine is converted into action. That's why I was telling you about the launching pad. It's action. It's divine viewpoint applied to the circumstances of life. Wisdom builds the edification complex for living the spiritual life. An edifice, in case you don't know that fancy word, is a building. And so the edification complex is like a building. Wisdom builds this building for living the spiritual life. Here we go again. Proverbs 3, 21 and 22. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6. Colossians 1, 9. James 3, 17. And those of you who have been studying with Joe Griffin at Grace Doctrine Church uh, have heard uh, James 3, 17 exegeted recently. I will read that verse for you uh, just because I'm in the mood to do that. So let's go to James. And that is right after Hebrews. There's Philemon on Wednesday night and then Hebrews and then James. And James chapter 3, which in the NET uh, is page 2304. And actually... Uh, we are looking at, where am I now? I somehow lost my spot. Help me, help me. What did I do wrong here? Oh. Sorry about that. I lost my spot. Okay, F, G, James 3, 17, page 55. Okay, and 317, that's why I said I, I was saying it was on page 2304. It's 2305 in the NET. Verse 17 says this, <clears throat> but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, accommodating, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and not hypocritical. And for the heck of it, let's read 18. And the fruit that consists of righteousness is planted in peace among those who make peace. You may want to resort to that in the way the world is going lately, and especially in America today, and the things going on today in our uh, land. So uh, James 3, uh, 17 and 18, kind of cut the mustard there. Okay, now, section three, uh, the relation of the heart to thinking and perception. Now, notice that that goes down the list like A, B, C, D, all the way down to I. So that's nine points. And, and then we have uh, section four, and then we have section five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and 11. Do you believe we're going to cover all that tonight? This is why we're not going to read all the verses, but I did want to read a couple here and there and encourage you to get these books and get this information and learn it. Uh, it's as good as going to church. Why? Because it's a pastor who wrote it and taught it. And nowadays we have electronic, contri electronic contrivances like what we're doing tonight, where you can watch me on an iPhone or a laptop or a TV and you can get this doctrine one way and another. Why? Because God provided it and God, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. And by being filled with the spirit, you can, excuse me, adjust um, to the justice of God. How do you do that? You learn Bible doctrine and you apply. <coughs> excuse me. So continuing, 
at letter three, you know, uh, major point three, the relation of the heart to thinking and perception. A, positive volition, Romans 10, 9 and 10. B, function of gap, Deuteronomy 29, 4. C, thinking of reversionism, Psalm 10, 6, verse 11 and verse 13. That's reversionism. D, thinking of atheism, Psalm 14, 1, where it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So the Bible does say there is no God. See, it says it right there, there is no God. But you got to take it in context. That's good exegesis. You have to say, wait a minute, the Bible says there is no God? Well, there's a phrase there, there is no God. But you have to read the whole sentence and it says, the fool has said in his heart, quote, quote, you know, colon, quote, there is no God, unquote. All right. E, rationalization of education, Ecclesiastes 1, 13 through 18, where Solomon waxes eloquent on the issues of life and the ridiculousness of it all. F, rationalization of mental attitude sins. Remember MAS, three kinds of sins. You start with mental attitude sin. It starts in the mind. Then it can become a sin of the tongue, and or an overt sin. Those are the three categories of sin in the Bible. Where does it say that? Rationalization of mental attitude sins, Isaiah 47, 10. G, communication of false teachers from the deceit of their hearts, Jeremiah 14, 14. That's a big one. H, meditation on doctrine, Luke 2, 19. Another cool, uh, obviously important thing. I, ambitious thinking. Luke 9, verses 46 and 47. Okay, now, uh, major point four, the facets of the heart. A, the heart can reject Bible teaching, Proverbs 5, 12, and 13. That's negative volition. B, the heart is the source of discord and troublemaking, Proverbs 6, 14, and 18. C, the heart is the prostitute, I'm sorry, the heart of the prostitute is cunning. Yikes. Proverbs 7.10. D. Hatred emanates from the heart. 2 Samuel 6.16. 6, e. The heart suffers disappointment from promises not kept. Proverbs 13.12. F. The heart promotes mental attitude sins. Remember we said three kinds of sins in the Bible. Mental attitude, sins of the tongue, and overt sins. You know, sins that you commit, that, uh, something you do. So, one, bitterness. That's a mental attitude sin. Proverbs 14.10. Sorrow and disappointment. Proverbs 14.13. Pride. Proverbs 21.4. Obadiah 3. Worry. Uh, Ecclesiastes 2.23. <coughs> G, a frantic search for happiness is related to the heart. Ecclesiastes 1.13. H, reversionism is described in terms of the heart. Jeremiah 17.5 and 9 and Zechariah 7.12. Um, Jeremiah 17.5, uh, I'm trying to remember it now verbatim. Um, that, you know, the heart is desperately wicked, blah, 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 uh, in five. Well, let's go there uh, real quick. Can you get to Jeremiah real quick? Uh, okay, Jeremiah 17, five, uh, that is in the NET, that is page, jump to 20 here, let's go back a couple more, 17, I gotta get these separated, there we go. 17.5 is on page 14.17 in the NET Bible. Give you a second to get to 14.17. So we have, and we're going to read Jeremiah 17.5 and 9. So here we have it. Uh, individuals are challenged to put their trust in the Lord. And remember, this says that reversionism is described in terms of the heart. 
In Jeremiah 17, 5, it says, the Lord says, I will put a curse on people who trust in mere human beings, who depend on mere flesh and blood for their strength, and whose hearts have turned away from the Lord. Now, I got to skip to verse 9. The human mind is more deceitful than anything else. It is incurably bad. Uh, what's the last line? Uh, who can understand it? Yeah, that's the section that I was telling. And then Zechariah 7.12. We won't go there. We'll just keep cruising. We get to the next page, which is page 56. So I remove this one and try to find the next one. <laughs> Uh, I should have noted the number on that one, but be that as it may. Oh, you know what? I can find the number. Let's see. We're going to. Page 56. And I will find that. There it is. All right. That's 4859. All right. Here we go. I am going to pull that one up. Ta-da. Love it when I can get this going. All right. Letter I on page 56. Revolution and insubordination are described as being in the heart. 2 Samuel 15, 6, Jeremiah 5, 23, Ezekiel 6, 9. J, hypocrisy is related to the heart. Job 36, 13. And Psalm 55, 21. Now, major section point five, the heart and emotion are analogous to husband and wife. A, just as the husband has the authority over the wife, so the heart has the authority over the emotion. If you wonder about that in the next verse or next section here, uh, letter B, Emotion in the body is designed to respond to doctrine in the right lobe, just as a woman is designed to respond to her husband. Ephesians 5, 22 through 24. So if anybody had a problem with this husband having authority over the wife, wait till you see how he's supposed to do it and how he's supposed to act and how God holds him responsible. Hmm. C. The heart and emotion are linked in the following scriptures. Psalm 26.2, Jeremiah 11.20, Jeremiah 17.10, and Jeremiah 20.12. Okay, uh, major point six. Happiness is located in the heart. Okay, gladness of heart, A. 1 Kings 8.66, 2 Chronicles 7.10, Esther 5.9. B, instead of gladness of heart, how about this one? A merry heart. Happy, happy. Proverbs 15, 13 and 15. And Proverbs 17, 22. Point seven, the heart and carnality. A, in carnality, sin nature takes control of the heart and short circuits the spiritual life. Remember, that was our diagram at the beginning, where if you're out of fellowship, you're controlled by the old sin nature and you have to rebound, First John 1, 9 get back into the filling of the Holy Spirit because, as it just said, a incarnality, the sin nature takes control of the heart and short circuits the spiritual life. <coughs> um, Psalm 66, 18, 101, verse 5, Proverbs 6, 18, Matthew 12, 35, Matthew 15, 18, and 19. That's Matthew 15, chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. Luke 6, verse 45 and Luke 24, 25. B, the heart is related to psychosis, Isaiah 13, 7 and 8. C, revenge, revenge is a malfunction of the heart, Proverbs 24, 1 and 2, Ezekiel 25, 7, 15 through 17. D, reversionism in the heart results in national disaster, Deuteronomy 28, verses 47 and 48. By the way, that's very much what's going on in our country today. And uh, I digress. Uh, major point eight, hardness of the heart, which is hardness of the right lobe. Okay, remember the left lobe, the right lobe, the noose, the cardia. 
A, scar tissue of the soul or hardness of heart is that stage of reversionism which accompanies or that accompanies blackout of the soul, Ephesians 4.18. By the way, there's a lot of information available in all these books that are available through the doctoral study Bible studies catalog from RB Theme Junior Bible Ministries. You just remember that you can get all of this incredible information. Okay, so as I said, um, scar a scar tissue of the soul or hardness of a heart is that stage of reversionism. There's a book on reversionism that accompanies blackout of the soul, Ephesians 4:18. B, when the effects of the blackout of the left lobe reach the right lobe, scar tissue prohibits doctrine from circulating in the soul. <coughs> One, the ability to utilize frame of reference and memory center as a source of doctrine evaporates. Two, doctrine is no longer fed into the vocabulary to develop doctrinal categories. Three, norms and standards degenerate. Four, momentum halts. Five, there is no wisdom for application in the believer's life. Without the flow of doctrine into the right lobe, all spiritual functions shut down. Okay, on to the next page. Let's go to page 57. And once again, I should have looked at the number that I need, but I'm going to take a guess here. Okay, share. And you get to the right one. I think we just did 50. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to guess it's this one. Oh, no. That's 55. The heck? That one shouldn't be there at all. Okay. 57. Instant. Oh, I see. That's fine. Okay. We'll get it. Um, all right. So let me see that we get appendix B. It's the letter C. Instances of the hardness of heart. One, hardness of the Jews during the incarnation, John 12, 40. Two, the Meribah revolution, Psalm 95, 8, Hebrews 3, 8, and Hebrews 3, 15, and Hebrews 4, 7. Three, the hardening of Nebuchadnezzar's heart, Daniel 5, 20. Four, Zedekiah's hardness of heart, 2 Chronicles 36, 11 through 13. Five, hardness of Pharaoh's heart, Exodus 7, 22 and 23. <coughs> and then again in 8, 15, 8, 32 and Exodus 9, 34. So we kept seeing the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. D, the hardness of the neck is the same as hardness of heart, but emphasizes insubordination more than negative volition. And so when they talk about hardness of the neck or the stiff neck, the stiff necked ones, the Anakim are the long necked ones. And if they have a stiff neck, then it's hardness of the neck, so to speak. But it means they have negative volition in the case of believers and emphasizes insubordination 2 Kings 17, 14, Nehemiah 9, 16, Jeremiah 7, 26, and 19, 15. E, solution to hardness of the heart. Since it is the result of negative volition toward doctrine, the solution demands rebound and positive volition toward doctrine. However, this positive volition must express itself in the consistent function of GAP. Remember, GAP stands for Grace apparatus for perception. So for letter E, we have Ephesians 3, 16 to 21, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, and Hebrews 6, 1 through 6. Those are all about the solution to hardness of heart. Nine, the heart in relation to the growing believer. A, grace function, Proverbs 24, 17. B, grace orientation. Exodus 23, 9. C, happiness, 1 Samuel 2, 1. D, stability in a crisis, Psalm 112, verses 7 and 8. Point 10, the heart in relation to motivation in life. 
A, temporal life, Exodus 35, verses 25 and 26, and also verse 35, so Exodus 35, 35, and then Exodus 36, 8. Now, that's temporal life. B, how about spiritual life? 1 Kings 8, verse 17, and 2 Corinthians 9, 7. So the heart in relation to motivation in life. In that second passage, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, uh, it has to do with the believer's ability to think clearly and give, as in proper motivation for spiritual giving. And um, it does in 2 Corinthians 9, 15 say, uh, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, meaning the gift he gave us of his son. Finally, our last point, major point 11, the heart as an anthropomorphism. 1 Samuel 2.35, that's going to be explained, and Jeremiah 23.20, and also Jeremiah 30.24. Now, derived from the Greek anthropos, it's down there on the bottom of the page there, anthropos, that's our English word man, where we get anthropology, the study of man, anthropos and logos, plus morphe. So you have anthropos, morphe, and we're saying anthropomorphism. <laughs> Excuse me. And so uh, the man and form and anthropomorphism is language of accommodation that ascribes to God. Here we go. Human physical characteristics like man form, like the hand of God. God is spirit. He doesn't have a hand. You know, the foot of God to kick you in the rear. He doesn't have a foot. He kicks you in the rear anyhow. <laughs> He doesn't have a tongue either to stick out. Remember, he is spirit. But so an anthropomorphism is language of accommodation that ascribes to God human physical characteristics, which he does not actually possess, to explain his policies, acts, and decisions in terms of human anatomy. Now, bonus that's not in the book here with our anthropomorphism is the other word anthropopathism, dealing with pathology and the fact that uh, the feeling, how you feel, pathos. Do you feel bad? Do you hurt? Uh, do you feel good? That's in pathology, the study of feeling, pathos and logos. And anthropomorphism was ascribing a morph, a body, a physical thing to God, and a man part, anthropomorphism. Anthropopathism is ascribing a mental attitude. So when it says God is angry or God is pleased, think of it this way. God doesn't get pleased and he doesn't get angry. Why? Because he's in perfection. And being pleased or being angry, you could say, oh, well, he's always pleased. Well, I could go along with that to an extent. But what I want you to get out of this is God doesn't change from pleased to angry and angry to please. Uh, and we think that way, like if we do this, God will be mad at us. If we do this, God accepts us and he's happy with us that we did it. Those are anthropopathisms explaining uh in a way, like what it says here, language of accommodation that ascribes to God, in this case, a human mental uh, attitude or characteristic, which he does not actually possess to explain policies, acts, and decisions in terms of human abilities and human thinking and human frame of reference. Okay, so now you have both the word anthropomorphism and anthropopathism. Uh, anthropopathism, uh, extra credit and extra data at no extra charge. <laughs> so we finish Appendix B. We continue next time with the doctrine of the conscience. And so you'll see more about that. Uh, and we'll maybe be able to look at more of the scriptures that we couldn't do today because there's so much going on today. Now we switch gears and it's late to do so. So I'm going to introduce it, but not get into all of it that I was going to get into. 
and I will get into the details, meaning I'll get into more of the, I have a whole chair stacked up with books because we're going to be looking at the information about books. Uh, it's the section that we're starting today is the importance of study aids in exegesis. So from our text, now I won't bother getting all this stuff up, but I did take pictures of it. Actually, let me see how fast I can get to it. Um, what are these? 668, 666. Is six the one that I want? Let me see. Uh, yep, it sure is. I'll go ahead and pull this one up. 4866. All right. Let me close these other ones because we're done with them. Actually, I'm wasting time by doing that, but it's part of my pathos. All right. Now we go, and by the way, it makes it easier now because when I hit share screen, uh, I can only see one page, and it's the one I want. All right. The importance of study aids in exegesis. And that is um, where we are in this exegesis manual, Principles and Practice of Exegesis. And what I'll say for tonight in closing uh, in this section, we'll take a look at the top section there, section four. It says, the importance of study aids in exegesis. Factual aids, language tools, and most reference works, that's what those factual aids are, language tools and most reference works, should be consulted repeatedly, uh, I'm sorry, repeatedly throughout the exegetical process. I tried to say repeatedly and exegetical together, and I got repeated, it's almost repeatedical. <laughs> All right, again, A, factual aids, language tools, and most reference works should be consulted repeatedly throughout the exegetical process. B, interpretive aids, such as commentaries and translations, are usually consulted later in the exegetical process. And here's an important point. It's very interesting. The exegete should work independently, and I underlined independently uh, right there. I don't know if you can see my... Uh, my marker, but I'm trying to get on that word. The exegete should work independently uh, in the early stages of the process in order to form his own tentative interpretation. This puts a student into the text first and foremost and allows for personal discovery. And I added, uh, I've got a couple of notes here. I got a smiley face, a check mark, and then it says in parentheses, with God. So where it says, allows for personal discovery with God because that's where God, the Holy Spirit, is showing the exegete little nooks or nicks and uh, little tidbits and stuff in the, like we say, the nooks and crannies, you know, the little things in between. Okay, next paragraph. At different stages later in this, uh, in his study, the exegete should consult interpretive aids in order to check for factors he may have overlooked to gain additional insight in problem areas and to validate his own interpretation in light of differing views. In other words, differing views, the views that are out there. Oh, let's see. Uh, I didn't put this note in um, that uh, when uh, uh, Leonard commented on anthropomorphisms and anthropopathisms. Yeah. Those are fancy, uh, and we're going to see more about that in as we get into the next part that we're not doing tonight here. See, it says, uh, major point five, the important resource materials for exegesis. And I underlined resource materials there, and I wish you could see this real big. I don't know if that happens when I shake it like that because I try to shake it to get – it's supposed to help you see the arrow. Uh, on screen, but I don't know if it does uh, through this uh, software that I'm using for broadcasting. So we will start there at um, major point five, 
the important resource materials for exegesis next time. And so, yeah, it makes sense because next Monday, when we finish our Mental Attitude Dynamics book, um, that particular doctrine, uh, and let me go ahead and take that out here and remove that. Um, the doctrine of the heart, I'm sorry, that, that's what we did today. That was five pages. But look, the doctrine of the conscience, Appendix C, which was referenced tonight, that's only this long. So my thought is that next week we can do these uh, 13 major points and we can actually look at the verses in them and it still doesn't take up all that much time, which means we can spend, and we will have a lot to do, take much more time in this text, which I'm really looking forward to showing you a few resources so that you get a good feel for what I do in preparation when I look at the things that we're going to, you know, study or discuss and all that and uh, and really get into and so how do i do that uh, i do it according to how this manual expresses the techniques the science the system for doing exegesis and that's why tonight hard to believe it was exegesis number 160 and the fact that uh, we are on a three-day weekend, so to speak, and that it's over uh, for all intents and purposes. Um, I think it's really great that we started the end of it to get on a roll with this doctrine of the heart. And I had a few other things that I might have liked to get into or show you, but um, just regarding the heart, there are several things that uh, are personal with me that are interesting that sometimes make it fun. And I guess I'll just leave it tonight with this, is the fact that um, having had two massive open heart surgeries, and they are massive, and it's amazing how well they do it. Uh, in fact, they do it so well that the result of my two uh, mitral valve repair surgery should have been one. But the way it turned out, I ended up having to do it twice. And when we did it the second time, the first one had its good results. It also, there was a problem lingering. So they had to do the second one. But the second one took advantage of the repair that was done in the first one and then went a, a level higher and made it so that I'm better off having had a need for a second surgery and then having the second surgery. I end up being totally healthy. I have no heart condition. I have no medications. I have no appointments. I am going uh, next week. I've got uh, a, uh, I guess you call it semi-annual kind of a physical. And at that time, we check on me and just decide how everything's going. And I'm going to suggest, and I'll see if they say no, but I'm going to say maybe it's been two years it's been now over five years since my first heart surgery, which was on June 7th of 2016. My second surgery was on September 12th, so 9-12 instead of 9-11 of that same year. So three months later, I have a second open heart surgery. Well, I haven't had an echo now in, I think, two years and we thought we'd go five years or even, you know, 10. And said, you know, you don't need to do that anymore. But I thought maybe now that it's been over two, we'll go ahead and do it again. Just to see how much has changed in two years. Now, even though I don't feel any issues or problems, I still think it could be getting worse, like hopefully by that much. So it's getting worse and they'd say, oh, that's normal. You're getting older. So it's going to have to get worse. Plus you had it repaired. You know, it's kind of like a car. When you rebuild a carburetor, it doesn't mean it's as good as a brand new one. It's not going to last as long as if you put a brand new one in. So 
I would say for my prayer requests tonight, I have two thoughts. The one being that, uh, that hopefully uh, we can do a, an echo and it's no big deal and that it would turn out well. So that's one thought. The other one is that I would get more regular, uh, what I would call full-blown workouts, you know, a good legitimate exercise because I haven't been getting that much exercise even as much as I got before COVID. And so I need to get back into doing more exercise and getting stronger again and getting healthier. Probably need to get out and get a little bit of sun. I'm going to watch it with that too because you don't want to get melanoma. And uh, I'm up in the mountains where the sun is strong, you know, and all that. But I should get some vitamin D that way because I get it as a supplement. And on that note, um, those two things for me, uh, my physical where I may get an echo, and secondly, that I get some exercise. Remember that the thing about prayer is you've got to be in fellowship when you pray. So the first thing is rebound if necessary. And if you don't know what that is, go to previous uh, broadcasts. They're all still uh, available on YouTube for sure. I don't know where they are on Periscope or whatever you call it now on Twitter. Second, after you know you're in fellowship, what do you do? You want to pray. You want to give thanks to God for everything he's doing in our lives. And how we are protected, have a wall of fire around us. Third is intercession and Boy, there are a lot of these issues, pastor and church, government, law enforcement, military, illnesses, pastors at large in their congregations, students of schools, you know, because all the schooling business is why we're having so much trouble. I, I, it's part of the reason uh, they've been inculcating, again, that word, been trying to train people to um, think a certain way. And uh, like Joe would say, uh, how's that working for you? Uh, but for those of us with Bible doctrine, we're fine. Okay, and last but not least, the fourth thing. So the first is rebound if necessary. Second, Thanksgiving. Third, intercession. Fourth, petition, where you actually go to God and say, hmm, God, what should I be doing? And I always talk to him about everything. Thank him for stuff and ask him a lot of questions. And, um, you know, he does answer. So, uh that is our issue for prayer. And I might as well mention on, on the other side of this board uh, that my current latest, almost recent CD, it's been a couple of years now, Home With You, uh, is available uh, for your listening pleasure <laughs> at no charge uh, on all the music subscription services, except maybe like Amazon Prime, where you have to have Amazon Unlimited to hear my album. But so if you can't do that, go to YouTube. It's, it's available. All, all the songs are there. And so you don't have to buy this. And what I love about it is, guess what? I don't ask you to buy anything. You don't pay for anything. And I get paid. <laughs> it's, it's a God thing for sure. So, uh, and uh, Peanuts as it may be, it pays uh, the rent. You know, it pays uh, whatever you got to deal with. That's my joke. But uh, honest. It's really fun and great. And the music is well put together. If I do say so myself, I did it myself. And uh, sure enough, by the way, if you do have a CD player and you like the stuff and you want to get in touch, I'll be happy to send you a copy of the CD. And uh, it is a whole lot of fun. It's got 12 songs. Uh, I'm playing all the instruments, doing all of the vocals, uh, right. I wrote eight of the 12 songs. The other ones, some of them you've probably heard. And uh, like I said, it's all, you know, legit. So um, look that up, please. Oh, and you also, uh, it helps to know how to spell my name there. See, one L for Philippe and two L's on Willems. And it ends like, like systems, EMS. And so um, if you look me up on YouTube, you can also watch a four-minute video. All right. All that said, I think we have uh, accomplished the mission for tonight. How about that? And thank you, Lord.
And look, I even drew a, a ha ha little flag. I, I try to make something artistic there. I'm, I'm, I'm an artist, but not a graphic or uh, visual painting and pictures and all that drawing artist. I am a musical artist. And hopefully you'll get to hear some of the things I'm working on now. And look, Gretsch drums, mic it, like it, get it? <laughs> mic it, like it. And uh, I wore my, my 4th of July shirt on the 5th of July. I didn't do anything on the 4th, by the way, in case you're wondering, didn't do anything. Actually, I didn't even hear fireworks, but I made a lot of noise right here because I'm in the middle of all that good stuff. Got all this equipment that I got to use and more equipment coming. And thank you. Come on, show it. There it is. A thank you from Leonard and a you're welcome from Philippe. <laughs> um, thank you for being here always. And for all of you who are watching or will watch this, um, I'm... I pray that it will all be a benefit to your soul and your life. And I mean it. And it's true. It, it really is supposed to be. So take advantage of it. Meaning not me and stuff, but Bible doctrine. The fact that the scripture, the word of God is our guide and rule. And uh, it's fun having all these incredible tools. And the fact that the Lord will help us. Let's see, what does this say? We had wall-to-wall -wall fireworks show here. Wow, uh, that's fun. Yeah, this year I actually didn't see a single one. And uh, I didn't miss it though, because I was having too much fun doing a whole bunch of good stuff. And I did watch a movie. I made you know some good uh, food <laughs> for dinner, of course, barbecue. But I decided I'd put on a movie and uh, I wish... You guys could see it. It was with uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme and it's called Derailed. So at least I can mention it. And uh, Derailed, even though it's the idea of a plan that got derailed and a train that's getting derailed, but the real issue is the release of a contagion. And this movie was made way before, I don't even remember what year it was, like 2006 or three or something like that. I think it's back then. It may even be older. But uh, it's funny because they end up with this like smallpox virus thing in the train and it becomes a big disaster, which uh, is nothing, uh, you know, I mean, it's got nothing on COVID. Uh, COVID ended up being all around the world. This thing got, you know, confined to a train, but it's an interesting, uh, you know, event. And to think that all of these thoughts were had before COVID and there'll be more after COVID and not just movies, more, uh, contagions. So let's close in prayer and we'll continue obviously on Wednesday night. Forgot to mention it even. Uh, but we will continue with uh, Philemon number 110, where we are still wrapping things up for the coming weeks and month or so. And eventually it'll wrap up. I just don't know when. But we already know in two weeks, on Monday nights, we begin this book. And you're going to like it. It says, heathenism answers the questions, what about those who have never heard the good news of salvation? And so that, that's the beginning of this back paragraph here, which I will hold up for a second there in case anybody gets a screenshot of it or wants to read it. And we will start that on the 19th of July. So that'll be not next week, the 12th, but in two weeks. So if you haven't gotten a copy, get it now and uh, you can have at it and go with us in this exciting, oh, I should show you the table of contents. That way you start to get a feel. Here is what the table of contents has to say. What about the heathen? 
the angelic conflict, the essence of God, the attributes of God. You're going to see a lot of this is review from the first basics books. Uh, the unseen soul, independent volition, the consequences of Adam's decision, strategic victory, unlimited atonement, God consciousness, uh, the mechanics of God consciousness. After God consciousness, what? Historical evangelism. So who are the heathen? The pattern of the he of heathenism, the answer to heathenism. So uh, imagine how that will relate to what's going on in our country and in our world today. You might like the uh, the subject matter. All right. So on that note, without further ado, it's time to close in prayer. Let us pray. Once again, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the time that we spent together and the things that we studied. Sure saw a lot tonight. Busy night. A lot of good stuff. And thank you that it all came together pretty well and, and that there was a lot. And um, thank you for this weekend where we had the opportunity to reflect on the fact that uh, the founding fathers of this nation came up with a plan 245 years later, we are still living in that plan. It's very jumbled up, but we thank you for that plan. And we pray that it continues uh, and that it continues along the right course, that it would be in line with your thinking, as I think originally it was designed. So we thank you for all these things. We ask them as always, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in Christ's name, amen. And voila. So have a good day or two. And I hope to see you again on Wednesday night. Same time, same station. 7.30, which is what? Pacific Daylight Time and Mountain Standard Time. And we will continue in Philemon. So have a good one till then. And uh, take care. Sure was fun. See you soon. Amen and amen, Leonard. All right, see ya.